What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and my friend, Danny Abeljar. What's up, Danny? How's it hanging, bro? It's hanging <laughs> low, man. Chilling as per usual. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. I can never complain. It snowed yesterday in New York. Yeah, yeah a little bit of a flurry. Um, I remember that, it, yeah. It did not stick. Mm -mm. But other than that, I'm just I'm just uh, surviving. Um, so what are we talking about today? Let's just cut to the chase. Yeah, sure. Uh, we're talking today about ancient Sumer and Akkad. So, aka, this is something that you should definitely bring up if you want to impress someone on a date. So if you're on a, if you're meeting somebody for the first time, so you're on a date. Um, well, now there's no dates anymore, I guess, right? Since since uh, we banned, I think there's uh, social virtual, interaction. I think there's virtual dating on online stuff now. Like I think uh, they're trying to push that, like Zoom dates. Zoom dates. So when you're on a first date and someone asks, "So what are you interested in?" Tell them that you're interested in ancient civilizations, and then report back to us. We want to know what happens. <laughs> so your primary interest is I like to study ancient civilizations. I'm specifically very interested in ancient Sumer, you know, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. In and I talked about some of the artifacts that I've studied firsthand. <laughs> I, would, I would always start with that when someone tells you, asks you what your interests are, because I guarantee that person will never speak to you ever again. I mean, I honestly think that might be a winning play because on my first date with my girlfriend, we ended up talking among many things about aliens so i think that work that might work but that's like kooky um <laughs> and everyone kind of has it's like a fun thing to talk about mm -hmm. um what and ancient mesopotamia isn't fun to talk about it is for dorks <laughs> it is for dorks and i imagine both you and i are not normal people no. um <laughs> most of the people who consistently listen to this podcast are not normal people um if they've listened to more than one episode <laughs> they're more most likely not a normie um, <laughs> So report back, say, hey, what are you interested in? Oh, um, you know, when that person says, oh, I'm interested in, um, you know, the bachelorette or if it's a guy and it's like cars, just say, well, I'm interested in studying ancient civilizations. Specifically, I like to study uh, pictography and, uh, and understand the origins of language. I study firsthand ancient artifacts. That's the way to do it. That's how you pick up chicks or <laughs> pick up guys in the 21st century. Um, but yeah, why are we talking about ancient Sumer today? Um, both of us are kind of sick of talking about politics. Um, you'll notice that we haven't really talked about anything too political lately. Um, I guess if you count like talking about uh, the I Irish Republican Army and and uh, the justification of who the target maybe that is a little political but other than that we've been <laughs> actually kind of been sick of uh talking about politics so we're talking about ancient civilizations now um th i think the most interesting thing about like, like um like the history channel and just any kind of mainstream um source for educating people about these ancient civilizations they make it as dry and as boring as possible. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. Because when I was younger, I used to not, I used to be a really big history buff. Uh, even when I was young, I used to love Same. American history mm -hmm. and, and medieval history and like Roman history. I used Social to studies really was my favorite that. class for sure. <laughs> when I was younger though, I always used to not find like, for, like, ancient Sumer and ancient Egypt very very interesting but then it wasn't until I got older that I discovered that wait wait there was a lot of interesting shit going on just our educators didn't present it the right way so hopefully we can change it without going into the kukudu formula because that's how like history channel will do it they'll yeah. be like were there ancient civilizations 20,000 years ago it must have been aliens oh <laughs> I actually how... I, I might actually go there today I don't know we'll see we'll find out oh, <laughs> we'll <no>. see <laughs> um no I, I mean honestly I I'm a little bit different from you in the sense that I, I was interested in in like these ancient civilizations I didn't know much about Sumer but definitely Egypt you know uh when I was younger but you're absolutely right a lot of the history channel stuff that I would like try to watch 
I w- it would be incredibly boring, but I wanted to learn more and that was like the only source of information that I can get at the time. So I would force myself to watch these really fucking dry like things about how they unearthed a tomb, you know, and like it would be like an hour long and all it would boil down to was some researchers dug a hole and found a tomb. Then <laughs> that's it. You know, like that's that's all you would get out of the entire episode. But they would drag it out over. Well, that's why hour. that's why the entertainment networks they put all these stuff about aliens in there, and that's why you see ancient aliens. It's like the number <laughs> one rated show in the history. Like if you go yeah. on the History Channel, it's just a marathon of ancient aliens. Yeah, I love almost it. <laughs> like how other channels at all times there's an episode of either Criminal Minds or Law and Order SVU. Yeah, on a lot of cable networks. Yeah, because they because they sell they well. Play. Yeah. Criminal Minds or SVU because they have so there's so many episodes and there's such a big market for it. That's what Ancient Aliens is for the History Network and Ancient Aliens is crazy. Like uh, maybe we'll argue a little bit about it, but the concept <laughs> is just. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, I think it's I, I think it's talk... within the realm of plausibility. But like, let's not get there before yeah. we already start <laughs> the actual okay. history. So let's. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's talk about the origins of civilization. Because um, I think that's where you really need to start. Because mm-hmm. we're going to start with, with ancient Sumer. Um, Sumer and Egypt, they, they start around the same time. It's really hard to tell when the civilizations go back so far. But I guess for just um, you know purposes of, of trying to establish some type of uh, chronological order of events, uh, which even historians debate about. I, I think it, we'll just start with ancient Sumer. Sumer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess the theory is, I mean, the most thought of theory is that civil, civilization begins in the Euphrates and Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River and Mesopotamia um, and in the Nile River um, in Egypt. Mm-hmm. And it's, they're, they're able to create civilizations due to surpluses in food. Right. Due to the grain storage. Totally. And, and that's kind of the basis of political systems. Yep. Like the, the ability to store grain and uh, forecast food supplies in the future. Mm-hmm. Now, there is a really interesting theory about, and this is a pr- pretty, a lot of like scholars find this pretty plausible. Um, it's called the challenger theory. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yeah, totally. Challenge response theory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So civilization arose in uh, in Sumer because something that is interesting is that there is a um, the, the the Tigris and the Euphrates River they they flood but they flood unpredictably. Mm-hmm. So right. there's a lot of flooding, but they, it can happen at any time. Right. And one they the attribute that, that to gods and and you know among other and their religion is actually super important for like the the establishment of their culture and, and their civilization. But to, to that point, yeah, totally fl- floods mad randomly it was them. very randomly so you get a sense of um you in order to combat the the floods then people need to band together and they need to create different types of, of uh, canals and irrigation systems to uh prevent being really just wiped out so this is where you had the first cities being built built in this area. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you have a different theory though, because in the Nile River, it's completely opposite. So the Nile River floods very predictably. Mm-hmm. You, you can predict when the Nile River is going to flood. There's, there's, it's like a ceremonial thing. And you, right. Also, still also heavily religious day. for them, and and you know, super it's important still, for their culture. It still floods to this day. Mm-hmm. In that case, they are just able to cr- create massive surpluses, um, and plus. Egypt is in the middle of the desert, so they relied on those agriculture zones because they didn't really have the ability to be or the resources to become nomadic uh, huntsmen, like, you know, hunters who would be traveling around. But um, civilization, let's just say, let's, for for uh, just e- purposes of making this an easy, fluid podcast, let's just start there. Sure. So what is your, what is your take on how 
uh, civilization started. Is it my take? Is it do you agree with me, or do you have something different? I mean, I, I for the most part, I agree uh, with you uh, absolutely. Just to give it a little bit more context, I think what's important to understand is that like the Sumerian civilization is like the cradle of civilization. That's that's what they call it. It is old as dirt. It is the, the oldest known civilization, you know, to date. We're talking about this. This sprung up in the aftermath of the last, last ice age which is probably around 8,000 BC, and, and the Sumerian culture probably starts springing up around 6,000 BC. Um, and this is a long time ago. Uh, so at the time, the, the lifestyle um, of the peoples that were in the, um, uh, in the area were, was more nomadic, more uh, hunter-gatherer, right? Uh, it, was very, um, it, it was very circumstantial to like where you were and what time of year it was and like, you know, how the the um, how the rivers flooded, as you point out, right? And it did so pretty randomly, and and I think in part due to your uh, you know, rising to the challenge, your challenger theory, you know, I think they definitely started settling down and create started creating surpluses through agriculture uh, and things like that. Um, as you pointed out, Mesopotamia means land between rivers and the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, and I, I pointed out kind of in, in passing that the, these rivers and the flooding. You know, became a big part of their uh, civilization, just as as fundamental pieces of it. You know, their religion, their cultures, uh, you know, their systems of government were were loosely bound to you know the activities of these rivers. Um, and uh, as you point out, the river would flood randomly, and they were actually very prone to flash flooding. Um, some you know interesting points on their uh, culture and their their pantheon of gods, their main god. Enlil, uh, there's this interesting, funny story about him where one day he just decided to kill all of humanity with a flood because they were too noisy. That was his rationality. <laughs> and uh, it's this, like, flood myth that, you know, was likely either shared or co-opted by the bi biblical flood that we know of with Noah uh, in our Judeo-Christian um, tradition. But uh, kind of... Going back to it, you know, I think early settlements of of those um, of those regions uh, in Mesopotamia were, um, you know, they they basically required most or all of their peasants to be engaged in food production. And what's important about this is that it it that fact started civilization. That was the reason why civilization started. They have a lot of people dedicated to the production of food rather than you know hunting and gathering. This created a surplus, and then that surplus enabled people to have non-food-producting like food -producting jobs afterwards, right? Things like... A division of labor. Exactly. So now, so now we a, can do there, things that don't immediately produce food, which, is, which creates the civilization. You have to wonder about the origins of man as, as a hunter and gatherer, if that was a preferred lifestyle at the time. Because being a farmer... Um, committing 16 hours a day to growing crops it's traced back to what around the year 5000 is when six we, yeah, we, 6, 6, 000, is when we think when we think the date is when when people when humans figured out out figured out how to do that yep they were like oh this is I a good think, idea i mm -hmm. think they probably figured out that if you put a seed in the ground and, and a plant grows i think they probably figured that out a really long time ago prior to 6000 bc right but Wouldn't you think they, that they yeah, realized? Sure, how I'm, I'm, I'm certain sure they understood. The I'm certain they understood the mechanics of like how plants grow. Yeah, uh, I'm certain. I'm, yeah, there was no way that they did not know the mechanics. <laughs> and basic. Um, no, I'm certain. What what what's no, interesting like, is is when they all start deciding like, hey, instead of me going out and trying to find this damn plant, what if I just force it to grow here? And I'm just when gonna, did that become easier? That's the, that's the question. So like, when did around, that become more around viable? Around six thousand, around six thousand in ancient Mesopotamia, right? Because it was in the, this fertile area where things grew really, really well. There was plenty of water because of all the damn flooding, right? Uh, and it was sunny and and it had like good good dirt to grow shit in. So they were like, hey, instead of me going out and trying to find this damn plant that I'm gonna eat, I'm just gonna like put it in the dirt right here. And it'll grow right outside of my, like, house. But being a hunter-gatherer, it, it has to be a more peaceful existence, wouldn't you think? And I, I'm not I, preaching no, I, like... I, I'd, I'd not, disagree. Uh, honestly, I would. You disagree? Yeah. Disagree? Be, be, I, 
I, th- I think it's 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 less peaceful because I, your your next meal is not guaranteed. You can't forecast your next meal. You know, you're at the mercy of nature for your next meal, and that's not, in my opinion, peaceful at all. Well, at the time, um, like now, we're kind of we had the benefits of civilization, where you right, know, it's right. to I'm biased. <laughs> very very comfortable lifestyles, but at the time of committing yourself full-time to agriculture as opposed to hunting and gathering Mm -hmm. um, it must have been a a harder way of life because you're still putting in very it's it's back-breaking work to to farm land it's slow money honestly it's slow money it also potentially brings future of war and invasion and thing and all those nasty things like that because right well they had know, at the time they were stuck no, in one place <laughs> they had no they had no idea that that would be an outcome and but that's not the only outcome right so I, th- I think what's important about this is that it's a give and take right on the one hand you have more predictability right you have less migration so you can put up roots so you can actually have like a really nice house right that was a thing that was uh, a possibility due to uh, agriculture before you were fairly nomadic you wanted to be able to pick up and move if the fucking flora and fauna decided not to not to give you enough food right so like having a nice place to live where you can set up and plant roots was like a positive benefit yes in in the future like later after we start making all these surpluses of goods and we start having explosions of population growth that would necessitate you know wars between city states yeah, sure. That when you look at it from that frame of of, of uh, mind, then yeah, it's, it sounds like a terrible idea. But it's all relative, and it's all a give and take. And I think at this juncture in history, the ancient Mesopotamians decided it was a smarter idea for them to plant roots and set up shop in this fertile crescent rather than bounce around everywhere and try and like follow or chase their food. And to that point, once they started creating this surplus of food. This actually um, did a lot of interesting things. So one of them, as I was pointing out before, it allowed for non-food producing jobs. Things like merchants and weavers, metallurgists and like fucking poets and artists and shit, like random shit that wasn't related to food. So now a culture can start, you know, uh, uh, developing. Architecture can start developing. All of this stuff is a direct result of the fact that we don't have to go and chase our food anymore. And we don't have to spend you know, our entire day and our entire lives thinking about where's our next meal coming from because we already know it's in the field right over there, you know? Um, and so I think the, probably the most the most important, um, like, staple for this type of civilization was Uruk, which was one of the city-states in ancient Mesopotamia at the time. Um, Just to add some, some uh, a little bit of color to that, Uruk is... We don't really know where the name Iraq comes from, but this is probably it. <laughs> this is probably where it comes from. Yeah. Uruk, is it, is it the Ur or Uruk? Yeah. Some mm-hmm. some British officer just made the word Iraq up. Like yeah. there's like we'll just call this piece of sand Iraq. Yep. It was most likely from Uruk. Right. But in in Uruk uh, is where we start seeing the first like civilization, like the first what we would understand as civilization, like large buildings were plentiful in Uruk as opposed to just nothing (laughs) like a bunch of nothing before Um, they had social hierarchies at the time Um, it was like mostly religious driven where our you know it was pre-stratified actually where the religious people uh, would run everything so they didn't have kings at the time they had like a like a religious like high priest if you will and then underneath the high priest they would have administrators like scribes, uh, some other priests, like lower priests, and then the bottom rung of people would be the peasants, the folks that actually did the, you know, the, the food jobs. And then there'd be like different stratifications between each of these rungs as well, but that's a, like a simple way of putting it. So that's like the first like caste system comes from there. Take it or leave it. You, you might not li- actually like that part. That might actually be a, a negative <laughs> uh, consequence of, of um, you know, this agricultural lifestyle. Um, But here's another really good one. So writing sprung up. The first known system of writing is is like Sumerian cuneiform. Um, And at the time, it was probably more of a way to keep record of things like taxes and food distribution. By the way, taxes. This is when taxes were established. I'm sure all the libertarians that listen to our show are probably, you know, cringing like, oh, fucking Sumerians invented taxes. Uh, Well, they did. Um, And then, uh, let's say, 
so oh yeah so back to cuneiform it, it it wasn't really like a like a spoken language more so than just like a like a rec- receipts it's picked up it's yeah. picked, picked, pictography all right that's the right word pictography it's yeah hier- the, the same thing as hieroglyphics it was kind of like hieroglyphics but it was better it was better Sim- than simple it was simple symbols right the the first forms of it looked more like hieroglyphics and then the late form of cuneiform uh is more like just kind of scratches and like symbols um and it was more like receipts to, to be very honest, rather than like spoken word. But then eventually they started using it to record more than just like, hey, today I gave, you know, fucking Henry 10 barrels of wheat, you know? And then it became something more like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I want to talk about in a second, but um, it's also possible. Um, so Ur- Uruk was kind of all over the place here. Um, and it influenced a lot of Mesopotamia and beyond. A lot of the architecture, um, a lot of the tools were found across the region from what today would be known as Syria to like Iran to like Turkey all of these areas were dominated by um, by the the culture and the and the stylings of Uruk um, and sometimes older uh, establishments that were in those regions were violently erased uh, from because of Uruk um, and uh, this was probably the earliest forms of organized warfare, which, to your earlier point, this is probably one of the negative drawbacks. Right? Because well, here, here is here is the point I was trying to make earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I'm not an anti-humanist, <laughs> where I think people should go back to nature. I, I enjoy civilization. Return to monk, I'm just, Henry. I'm just saying, at the time, <laughs> I don't know. Becoming a farmer and working the land. I wonder how preferable of a lifestyle that was compared to maybe somebody who was still like, you know, chasing after Buffalo or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, just because in those areas, so in Sumer, in, we may, we might talk about Egypt. We might save Egypt for another episode because it's, there's, there's so much content, but you know, we were comparing, we were planning on comparing the two today. So we might stick Egypt in another episode, but one of the big differences between Sumer and Egypt that I want to just stress right now is that Sumer is wide open with no natural boundaries. Yep. So it's flat. because of that, <laughs> yeah. you have different people moving in from different directions. Yeah. Was, Therefore, it's the polyethnic. Experience. Yeah, it was it was polyethnic for sure. There was yeah. It, yeah. Therefore, the, the, this it's an area that experiences a lot of turbulence and warfare. Mm-hmm. Um unlike Egypt, which is in the middle of the desert. So, right. or the ancient Egyptian civilizations on the Nile were largely remote from other societies, so they didn't have that same... They're more, homo- they're more they're homogenous, same. yeah, for sure. Um, now, they... Between 3000 BC to 2400 BC, um, allegedly, these dates that go back so far in history, they're always changing um, in, like, the scholarly circles, so... Um, we're just saying that long fucking time ago, ago. <laughs> long, yeah. a long time ago yeah um these city states were always at war and they're also warring against against foreign enemies like the sumer's main and like they're one of their big rivals were the uh elamites yeah of northern iran right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and what's really interesting is that the first recorded war between um between iraq uh, and iran iraq Iraq and Iran was mm. in uh, what is modern day Basra. Right. So it was in the southern part of Iran and And that's uh, where it went, and that's where the Iran Iraq war happened anyway. And that's exactly where yeah. the Iran Iraq war was. So the first war is the spot of where the second war is, which is just so, kind of like a funny weird cyclical thing. What do they history. say like history rhymes, right? Yeah. Well, back then they these ancient societies didn't believe in a linear form of history that right. didn't come until the hebrews mm-hmm. the hebrews were the first ones to believe like you know we're going forward um mm-hmm. and that kind of leads to a lot of um ideas within western civilization like um you know like pro- the progressive motion of moving forward or um a lot of ideas within greek philosophy like that hebrew right. uh, linear view is um is um really influential and, and because previously it was cyclical where they thought that time moved in circles and 
that's with both um, a lot of the city states in the Sumer and, and, and along with Egypt. Right. And kind of going back to an earlier point that you made, you know, about how um, uh, multicultural, multi ethnic uh, the Sumerian a- area was and how that caused a lot of conflict. Uh, another, probably, arguably bigger point of why there was so much conflict was because of the need for resources, right? So things like wood, uh, minerals, and metal uh, were not, you know, very, very common in southern Mesopotamia, so they had to get it from elsewhere, which caused them to go to other places to get it. And, you know, it it was out of necessity, it was out of differences of opinion and culture, Um, but, you know, it's even um, noted, uh, to make another reference to Egypt, that uh, Uruk had some presence in Egypt, like had some influence in Egypt because there's some ancient tombs that were constructed in a similar style uh, to Urukian architecture. Is it Urukian? I'm going to call it Urukian. Um, but eventually Uruk kind of rapidly declined out of nowhere. No one really understands why. But, but a lot of um, scholars and like historians suspect that it could have been like revolts from the people that they colonized as in their quest to try and get more resources. Um, and that, that kind of like jumped us to like the early dynastic period of, um, of uh, ancient Mesopotamia, which is like 2900 to 2350 BC. Also, another fun note, it's interesting how how uh, the dates go backwards in the BC time, right? And that always tripped me up when I was a kid. Did that ever, like, like freak you out when you were a kid? Like how the numbers no, went backwards? No, because I'm not a moron. I don't know why that always <laughs> just, like, bothered me. I was like, why is it going backwards? <laughs> um, it is kind of weird when you think about it. It's super weird. It's not, if it's, it's not just some linear date. Yeah. It's not so we're not in year. Um, I'm so terrible at math that we're not in year like ten thousand right now. You know, we're in. Yeah, well, I guess because they weren't recording history that way. Before no, they weren't. Our, they weren't. So they had to. Um, we don't really know the exact date of Earth. You know, so we, we'd have to be like, oh, are we up to the Earth is four billion years old? Something like that. No, so, 14, 14 billion. Where is that the solar system? Four, I forget. No, it's four, 4 billion. 14 billion is the universe. My bad. Wrong wrong thing. 4 billion sounds right. Um, But where, but where was I? All right. But what, what I wanted to talk about was, um, I guess, do you want to talk about religion first? or do you Yeah, want to let's, talk about- let's do religion before we do warfare, because I think the warfare one is a little more interesting, and I can probably... Right. Let, let, me, let me add my... Yeah. Uh, crackpot theory on on how religion is formed and um sure. you you uh tell me what you think if you agree or disagree mm-hmm. i think religion is formed at this time um as a as a positive reinforcement for the hard manual labor of, of farming because no one wants to fucking get up every single day <laughs> and sow the crops yeah. or but if you don't do that if you don't create that surplus then you're all going to die, you know. If that becomes like a common theme within the, within the, um, within the society, um, so I think that is a big part of how re- religion is created at that time, at that time period. Yeah. But what's your? Yeah, I, mean, I have a similar take. Um, I, I don't necessarily know if I would, you know, put very nefarious, um, you know, uh, kind of. It's not a nefarious behind not, it, you I know. Don't, I don't know if it's nefarious, but yeah, I, I don't either, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, I definitely know that you know the folks who who became the high priests and ultimately the top caste of the society were definitely the lazy ones that were just abusing, you know, religion to you know uh, make it so that they don't have to toil in the fields. Uh, that's that's ab- abundantly clear to me. Um, but I think some combination of like uncertainty about like. The mysteries of the world like in this region specifically like why the hell does it flood randomly <laughs> you know like how the hell is that a thing and and so some combination of that to try and help explain that you know when it when it would randomly flood and like destroy all of our crops it must be because some god was very pissed off at something that we did right some combination of that and you know the the thing that we said before where you know some people just want to take advantage of the religion so they don't have to work in the fields you know i think it, probably both are true so there's probably some truths to both of those things but I, I think definitely if we look at the history of it religion plays a huge part in mesopotamian um civilization and culture 
um, you know, it's almost um, necessary because that control that um, that the religious institutions of ancient Mesopotamia had is what organized the government and what organized the you know the rapid and massive expansion of both population and technology, architecture, and war. Uh, like this was a huge. This was the glue that held it all together. You know, and and in places like Uruk. And after that fell, there started springing up a bunch of different city-states, right? Uh, places like Uruk, which was technically the same city, but just like after it was in its prime. Um, Eridu, Ur, Nippur, uh, and Lagash, among many others. Um, and like I said, there was just a drastic increase in population from both food surpluses and immigration. Like people were literally just coming to ancient Mesopotamia because they heard from wherever they were that like this place is dope. Right, so they would just come, and since they don't have any like, land borders, no, you know, nothing, no mountains, no nothing like that to prevent people from coming, it would just naturally increase their population. And so, because of these nat giant expansions, we would start to see these military leaders um, spring up, uh, who would eventually become the uh, the first kings, the first like proper kings in the in the region. But um, one such king, and this is kind of going back to the religious aspect of it, was Gilgamesh. You might uh, know of the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's one of the, you know, the, the one of the most important texts of, you know, uh, this this time period. Um, but he was probably a military leader from Uruk. Uh, historians are not 100% sure. Uh, he might have been completely fake. Uh, that's also a possibility. Um, but, you know, he, he kind of plays that part. Uh, in this story, and this, I can give you a short version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is, which I always found pretty like an interesting story. So we got this dude named Gilgamesh, and like I said, he was a king, but he was a total dick. Uh, he was kind of rapey too. He would rape people. Uh, like one thing he would do is like sleep with brides before their husbands on their wedding night. You know, like that kind of a dude. He was kind of Harvey Weinstein. A hundred percent, right? He was a total dick. He was he was a tyrant. He would. Use forced labor to, to you know construct his buildings, like you name it, he was a dick, right? Um, and his subjects were like so pissed that they had him as a king that they asked the gods for help. Here's the, here goes the intervention of the gods here, you know, for the for the course of history. And so the gods created this wild dude named Enkidu, uh, who was apparently evenly matched in um, in like power and wit and like looks as as Gilgamesh. And when they finally you know, like meet. Uh, they immediately like start to wrestle and they get into like this stalemate and because they were evenly matched somehow this like turned into a bromance like they just became boys after that they were like oh you're pretty cool like you want to be friends all right cool and then they go on this like crazy like Gilgamesh decides to go on a crazy adventure just because with his new boy uh, to go kill a demon in the forest named Humbaba so they go on this nuts journey into the forest to go kill Humbaba and together with the like help of a sun god, they kill Humbaba, cut his head off, and then they chop down some forbidden trees and ri and like create a raft and ride down the river to go back um, to where they came from to Uruk. Uh, but on the way, the goddess Ishtar gets the hots for Gilgamesh, but he rejects her for whatever reason, uh, and she gets pissed off, so she sends the bull of heaven down. Like, Ishtar must have, been a, must have been a lesbian. She was, dude. She was mad. She was mad that that Gilgamesh wasn't trying to have it because he was trying to have like boy time with with Enkidu, and he's like, nah, man, I'm not trying to like go away, you know. Thought. Anyway, um, so he, so she's pissed. She sends down the bull of heaven to try and like you know kill them, right? And then him and Enkidu kill the bull of heaven. Uh, and at this point, now the gods are pissed off because they're like, yo, these two are boys. This is not supposed to, this wasn't what we planned. So they decide one of them has to die. And that one was Enkidu. So then Enkidu gets sick. He dies. Uh, and then at this point, Gilgamesh is like super sad and he starts fearing his own death. So he goes on this like solo adventure to try to find um, uh, immortality. Uh, and the way that he does it, he, he goes to find this dude named this is a fucking hard word. Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim. Uh, he's like the Mesopotamian Noah from the flood myth. Remember when I told you about Enlil, the the, the main god who flooded everyone because they were too noisy? Uh, well, this was the one guy that he let live. <laughs> he's the, the lone survivor, him and his family. Um, it's 100% like Noah's Ark. This, that's, that's the story. 
Uh, anyway, so uh, the, the gods evidently gave this guy Udnapishtim uh, immortality, so Gilgamesh wanted to go find him. And that trip was crazy long and crazy ridiculous, but he finally gets to him, and then Utnapishtim tells him how to get immortality, but it would be hard. And Gilgamesh is like, yeah, sure, I'm going to fucking do this. I spent all this time getting here. I'll, I'll be fine. And he tells him, all right, you got to stay awake for a week. <laughs> and Gilgamesh falls asleep, like, pretty much immediately. So he fails. Um, and then on his way home, uh, Utnapishtim tells him about, about a plant that can restore his youth at the very least. Like, he might not get immortality, but he can become young again. And it's in the bottom of the fucking ocean, and somehow uh, Gilgamesh gets it. And then on his way home, a snake steals his plant, and, you know, pretty much end the story from there. <laughs> like, he comes home empty-handed, and he realizes that the real, um, the real friends, uh, uh, the real uh, adventure was the friends he made along the way. <laughs> and that's the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. What do you think? <laughs> um, well, I guess, and I'm sure there's a lot of valuable lessons to be learned at the time, but um, I guess since we're learning about it in the context of the 21st century, it, it sounds like the ravings of a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like the story because it's not like this, tip, this like typical like good guy does some good things and like you know happy ending. It's more about like this bad guy who kind of learns to be not so bad but then doesn't get what he wants in the end and then is just satisfied with the fact that that's life. So it's like a really like more realistic of a story, you know, and it's, it's super interesting that that's, yeah. the, that that's the epic tale that they tell in the first civilization of the history of humanity. Well, it's interesting how these types of legends and stories emerge at, at this time and, and how this, this mythology is created. Um... Anyway. I don't know what the exact lessons are <laughs> that we learned from that. I'm not smart enough to know that type of information or to configure or interpret um, what the Sumerians were thinking at the time. However, um, I can tell you about some cool artifacts that, some cool fossils, bro, that are found there that tell a lot of uh, that that tell you a lot about Sumerian society that I think is just fucking really interesting and I'm not even being facetious or sarc sarcastic right now about this. Um, have you ever heard of the steel of vultures? Is it steel or steely? It's just, I I think it's the steel of vultures. Okay, well we're, we'll go with steel. Uh, yes, I have heard of it and it's fucking cool. So the steel of vultures is one of the most significant historical artifacts of this period maybe of all time and it's called the steel of vultures it's a monument that's celebrating a victory of a city-state of Lagesh over its neighbor Uma mm -hmm. and what it shows is the king of Lagesh he's leading an infantry um, he's leading the infantry of phalanx of armor so helmeted warriors armed with spears trampling their enemies. So have you have you seen this? Yep. Yep, it's so, it's super interesting because this is like the it's it's like the first depiction of um organized warfare. And then just by looking at the pictures you get an idea for how much awesome military tech they they were able to create and I guess the reason why they were why they created all this awesome military tech is because they were in this constant state of warfare against each other for the reasons that we described before. It, what's what's interesting about it is that it so it's showing off the technology they had at the time. Mm -hmm. So we have um, we have infantry, we have armored infantry, we have helmeted warriors, we have spears, and they're 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 telling you a story that they're on their they're walking on their enemies so right. a bunch of people beneath the horses being stomped out right they're trampling over obviously their enemies, right? mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's a symbol of that they're abusing you know whatever the, the people that they just conquered right um in the king in the king's hand he has a socket axe and he's riding a chariot and in a lower panel the king's also there's another depiction of the king he's holding a sickle sword so what we know from that is that Sumerian infantry 
they fought in a, a flanks formation. Phalanx. So a phalanx formation. And that's how you pronounce it. I always say phalanx. I've been pronouncing mm-hmm. it wrong my entire life. You put um, the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> now, a phalanx formation organized a six files deep. So it's with the it's with an eight man front and it's like it's similar to what the formations of what the ancient Greeks used to use. Yep. Do. Mm-hmm. So what we know about that type of infantry setup is that it requires training and discipline and yeah. these had to be professional soldiers. Yeah. Yeah, no, to- totally. And I, I think at first they were probably conscripts or like volunteers um, because that's how all professional armies start. But just like very much like, you know, a lot of the current wars in the, in the region, you know, you stay there long enough and you have enough battles and you quickly become a seasoned veteran. And, you know, these people become battle hardened. And so part of this battle hardening is, you know, this very, very advanced um, organization like before you know wars or what would you know what you would might consider a war was fought very loosely and very disorganized and like you were responsible for making and crafting your weapon and, and or armor if you were lucky enough to have one whereas now uh, we see standing armies and, and mercenaries together uh, where the the kings and the the, the religious uh, um, people would you would supply the armaments and would supply the you know research and development for creating new new weapons and new tactics and things like that uh this was very very different it's like going from a fist fight to like a like organized war um and that's what's so important about this and i think you you kind of breached uh, briefed over a lot of the technology there i think there is so much that's in there that was important well, Let's go over mm-hmm. it. Let's, yeah. let's 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 go over um, piece by piece sure. what's it, what we find in the steel of vultures because it's a showcase of you know what Marion it, it's a it's a recorded piece of uh, of history that is showcasing you know what they had at the time. Mm-hmm. It'd be like finding a picture of like our troops, you know, with with guns and tanks and stuff like that. Right. So um, first thing, the helmets. So these these were copper helmets. And what that probably marks is the first defensive response to the mace, right. which the mace is the oldest, probably the oldest weapon ever made. Definitely it's the just oldest. Some, it's a fucking rock on a stick. You know, a rock like, on a stick. Right. So you have a, a defensive, a, an item that is a uh, defensive in nature. So you see that from Sumer. Um, yeah. The most striking thing is the chariot. Yep. So, the first military application of the wheel is depicted on on the steel, which shows um, it's King Enatim riding in a chariot, and the, Sumer- the Sumerians also invented the wheeled cart, mm-hmm. which became the standard vehicle for log- like logistical transport in the Middle East until until the time of Alexander the Great. Right. And really, I mean, the chariot ranks among the, the major military innovations in history. Undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. Um, however, what most historians believe that this version of the chariot probably was not a major weapon at this point in time yet, because there was no there's no evidence that the Sumerian chariot was ever uh, being produced in, in in quantity. Yeah, well, they were hella expensive, and and very very difficult to manufacture at the time. But the fact that they had them and that they used them, I read somewhere it was like, like uh, the the main king would commandeer the chariots of the lesser governors and like vassal state, you know, heads, and each of them were responsible for having their own chariot or chariots, plural, and maintaining them and creating them and things like that. There wasn't like a like a central production hub for chariots. Um, they were very expensive. They were status symbols, um, but they were very effective too. But I think because of like what you said, because they weren't created in quantity, you wouldn't necessarily consider it like a a very important weapon at the time. There probably weren't units of chariot like no. chariot units that were used no. for uh, like striking people at a right. long distance and then chasing down uh, fleeing forces. I don't think they were used like that. Um, but you know, later chariot drivers and, 
and archers and, and spearmen, they became the elite fighting corps of a lot of the ancient militaries. Mm-hmm. Um, the sickle sword. The sickle so, sword? The sickle sword. Um, it shows a king holding a sickle sword. And the sickle sword becomes the primary infantry weapon of, of the Egyptian and basically all the biblical armies mm-hmm. that come at a much later date. And there's there's strong evidence that the Sumerians invented the sickle sword. Yep. Um, very, armored, very likely. Armored cloaks. So they're wearing what appears to be um, what is the first representation of body armor. And then the socket axe. So um, I guess the, the first axes were, were pretty just blunt in nature. Um, these were axes that could um, pierce any type of plated armor. So it'd be able to uh, uh, pierce bronze armor, pierce leather armor. It'd be able. It just had higher killing power, and that had to do with how the the blade was attached to the actual staff. Right to the hilt. Right, and that's the, the important. Hilt. That's the important part of this. That it's the socket in the socket axe because they yeah. they had axes right for cutting down trees and like you know cutting things. And they did use them, you know, uh, for self-defense and for warfare. But the problem is that the way that they were, that those axe heads were affixed to the, you know, to the hilts were, it was really super weak. So they were able to create this bronze socket that you can put around the hilt and affix with pins. And it made it so that it held on much tighter so that it would survive a massive blow against something hard like bronze. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy to think that they had bronze. They even had bronze armor at this time. Yep. Um, I mean, it was the Bronze Age. That's the, I guess yeah. that's why they call it that. Mm-hmm. Um, the the military organizations. So we don't know much about the military organizations of of Sumer in the third millennium. Um, it's, I think a lot of the stuff that's out there is, is speculation. We do know that. A typical city-state around the year 26 BC, for instance, could have potentially 30 to 35,000 people living there. So a population of that size could probably support an army between four to 5,000 men. Yeah, for sure. And and by some accounts, uh, and I know we'll probably move on to Akkad at, at this point, but Sargon of Akkad um, fielded an army force of approximately 5,400 men to many accounts which would make it, doesn't sound like a lot now, but that would make it legitimately the largest army in the entire world at the time. Let's, let's talk about talk about Sargon of Akkad. Or just because, Akkad in general. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah sorry, well, yeah, Akkad. Um, so Akkad is a city-state up in the north, the northern part of Iraq, right? Yep. Uh-huh. And, and they in, come in, down in Mesopotamia, to, yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of like where the... Um, where that very narrow strip happens between the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, up towards the north. Um, and specifically Sargon, uh, he's an interesting bloke. He uh, he has a mythical backstory uh, that reads a lot like the story of Moses, like he was apparently put in a basket and floated up the river and then like a king and Akkad picked him up and raised him as a son and like all this other random mythical shit. Um, all that was probably bullshit, or at least most of it was bullshit. Um, but what I think, what I think a lot of people point out about this is that uh, Sargon was different in the sense that the way that he wanted to be known and his backstory to be known was that that came from humble beginnings rather than, you know, um, like this kingly like hegemony, uh, very likely so that he can gain favor with the common people. Uh, and he used religion, here comes religion again, very, very interestingly uh, to his advantage um, in that when he would conquer places, he wouldn't go around saying, I conquered this. He would go around saying the gods gave me this. Right? And it, and it set up a, a, a like supernatural legitimacy to his reign, which was very instrumental um, in how he was able to conquer so much. And so, pretty good PR. Yeah, to- totally. He he knew what he was doing. Um, 
Well, think about it, though, because if we had a full-time army of 5,400 soldiers, and, and I saw the source of that. It's a, like an ancient script that says he had an army of 5,400 uh, soldiers. Right. You, you never know how accurate this stuff is, but I think it's like the... <laughs> He's probably flexing source. a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it could be flexing or, or, or whatever, but um, it's astonishing that he was able to... to create an empire in that region uh, with all over all the states in Sumer um, because there's 14 major city states at that time. Yep. So to think about it, he would have had to have a, um, not only a battle hardened army, a well equipped army, but they had to not only be able to defeat all these different city states, but they had to enforce, you know, their, their codes of ethics and laws and whatever and whatnot mm -hmm. in those same areas. So, you would think it would have to be pretty bigger, but at that time, um, Sargon's army was definitely the the most well, the, the best army around. Without a doubt, without a doubt, and I think you know from like twenty three hundred BC on, Sargon basically launched the greatest military campaign uh, conquest like ever seen ever at the time, and he united basically all of Mesopotamia. Um, Within ten years, he he went all the way from Akkad straight up down to the Persian Gulf, right? Um, and it was very interesting because when he got there, he did this like ritual ceremony where he was washing his blades in the river, which was like um, symbolic that like oh I've conquered everything there is to conquer, you know. Um, but he didn't stop there because then he, t he went back up north and he, he pushed all the way northeastward uh, to the Taurus Mountains in Turkey. This dude's reign, like, he, he covered a lot of ground. Um, and I think what he provided was the first good example of a military dictatorship ever. So military dictatorships came from Sargon. Um, no, no, no society, hands down, was even close uh, to the to the application of military weaponry and tactics as was Sargon of Akkad. I think, you know, this is something that greatly overshadowed even Egypt, who by that point was probably already a thousand years old, but didn't have anything close to as good weapons or tactics as, um, as Sargon did. And that's very likely probably because of the, uh, you know, the challenge issue that you were talking about. I'm going to pause for some technical difficulties here. Looks like we lost Henry, so we're going to call him back and see what happens. So if you're still watching, we're having some technical difficulties here. I am currently texting Henry, and it looks like we're going to try and get him to answer again. So just please hold.
All right, everybody. Um, we're just gonna end the live stream. Too many technical difficulties. We're gonna continue this on um, our own here, and then we'll we'll definitely post this up. If you are uh, watching this on YouTube, we encourage you to listen to the full episode on Friday uh, after we've got it all stitched together. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Uh, thanks. See ya.